So we're out here and it's been a high, high water spring, early summer. And the water levels have come down quite a bit, 25% in the last three or four days. But the visibility is still only, I would say about three, four feet. And because of that, um, the, there's not lots of fish rising, even though we have mahogany dunce, we've got pale morning dun mayflies, oh, we've got a few um, golden stones, so bigger golden stones. We also have lime sallies, yellow sallies, and a little yellow st uh, stonefly. We have a fish, I think it's a male rainbow, maybe 20, 20 inches, rising right in here, a classic spot where a bucket intersects with the seam coming off on an outturned corner, and he's just basically using that seam, popping, popping. But he's not popping pop, 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 pop like in a mayfly hatch. He's not pop, pop, pop like a caddis. He's not crushing the water like he would taking golden stones. So I'm thinking he's probably not touching the lime sallies because that those are pretty, pretty wispy uh, flies profile wise. I'm thinking that's probably the yellow, little, yellow, uh, little yellow sally, not the little yellow sally, sorry. He keeps rising, it's throwing me off. Um, I'm thinking it's the little yellow stones. And those are about, not quite, maybe seven eighths of an inch long and a narrow profile, a little bit uh, earthier brown with yellow than just a bright yellow of a little yellow salad. That's what I'm thinking it must be eating because I've been watching and I've seen a whole bunch of mahogany dun mayflies go through, nothing. I've seen a few PMDs float over, nothing. I've seen some um, lime sallies kind of do that, no. Nope but I don't see what he's eating. That's the frustrating part. And so I can't really time, time the observation. So what I'm gonna do is start off with the dry fly, kind of uh, maybe a small stimulator or an oversized elk hair caddis, that kind of thing. And just drip that over one, two casts, see if he eats it. If not, I'm gonna keep that same fly on and use a dropper nymph, maybe a foot below with maybe a little yellow fusion nymph, uh, that kind of thing. Just, just subsurface because you can't rely on this fish to pop 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 um, he'll go three four times quit for two three minutes and then he'll go pop 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 again so I'm wondering if he's just kind of circling patrolling in and out of that bucket and nosing back into that seam and feeding just kind of doing a real search or is he just on point because I can't see in there is he just on point and just feeding up as he feels like it but feeding on nymphs consistently on uh, my money, it'd be, it would be a one cast shot on a nymph to get a take, but we really want to try to get the dry fly to eat. So here's the most boring um, elk hair caddis <laughs> box in the world. Essentially, it's a whole series of different sizes of elk hair caddis, as you can tell. Uh, one, two, three, four, five rows of a size 14 elk hair caddis. Guess what? We fish a ton no matter where we go. Uh, from there, you've got some small poly wing caddis. Um, they, they can also double as Sally stoneflies. You come down here and all these poly wing, um, they're basically small stonefly stimulators just with a poly wing. And then you have some elk hair wing stimulators and then just larger sizes of elk hair caddis. I'm gonna start somewhere in this range here, this realm, because it's an earthy toned um, yellow, small yellow stone. I'm gonna probably just pick out one with a bit of a darker wing, not so much a lighter wing and just start off with that as the dry fly. So that fish is literally right down here on the seam. I've got basically a size 14, well maybe a size 12 hook with a 2x shank, just a classic little uh, palmered hackle over top of some ice dub with an elk hair wing. I've got that on 3x because the visibility is, what, again, three feet, I, the, the, the 3x isn't gonna matter. And I've got a, I've got a built up you know, I just took a 9-foot 2x uh, tapered leader from Orvis and I just added 18, 20 inches of 2x and another 18, 20 inches of 3x. You don't have to get technical. I mean, really, I could just put this all on a 9-foot 3x leader because the water conditions and the clouds are in our favor. But because I'm anticipating setting myself up for the day and I know that I can work this fish with that length, I'm just going to stick to my standard setup, what I fish, you might fish something different in these conditions. Again, a nine footer is acceptable, but I don't know if I'm gonna be check nymphing later. I don't know if I'm going to be deep nymphing under indicator later. So I'm just gonna set up as though I'm ready for the day. I'm gonna go ahead uh, pretty quick here. I'm gonna sneak around. I'm not gonna go straight down here and expose myself to the fish. I'm gonna walk around 
and come up along the shore and I'm gonna wait for a rise or two uh, just to get exactly where that fish is. I've got an indicator on the, on, the, on the shore below me, which is a stick on shore that's literally pointing right out to the scene where the fish is rising. That way I know when I get down there, I look upstream to the stick, triangulate right out to the, to the seam, and that's where I'm gonna be looking for the fish rise. Okay, so I was wrong, uh, or maybe not so much wrong, just either I didn't rhythmically time it the right way when this fish is cycling the eddy, or he just doesn't want the mayfly or the stonefly at all. So pulled out the mayfly box. I'm just gonna go with a darker wing, darker body, one size bigger because it's murky water, uh, mayfly pattern. And I'm just gonna put that in there in a minute and we'll see if that cures my uh, lack of ability to catch this fish. things you have to watch when you're fighting a fish in this situation. Yeah, you caught it up there. Um, fighting it all through here, the temptation is to run out here and get close to the fish uh, so you can land it or, you know, you just you lose your emotions while you're fighting a fish. Um, but this is a big back eddy. So if you walk out here, all this mud that's on shore will go that way. And if you want to tip off the rest of the pool that you're here, just send a huge plume of mud back into where all the feeding fish are and you'll go oops real quick because it'll, it'll put things off. So that obviously went pretty well. Uh, a long, slender, I don't know, 22, 23 inch cut bow actually. Uh, spawned out, we're early, mid July, and these fish stopped, you know, they finished their spawning season about middle of June here. Uh, we noticed last year that the fish were still spawning on reds early June. So you couple a late spawn as well as high water for most of the year and you're gonna get fairly skinny fish. That was a long fish, a healthy one, gorgeous fish. Now let's talk about the sequence. So the 3X was not ever gonna be an issue and that's simply because of the water clarity as and the, and, the, and, the, and, the and the speed of the water, the flow of the water was pretty heavy through there. So you got those two factors plus um, it was rising and I was casting during cloud. Um, I got a little bit distracted because I thought that fish was targeting stone flies because it wasn't rising very often, but there was lots of mayflies going through, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's just taking the odd stonefly. No, 
And then I thought, well, I know that he wasn't taking PMDs because I saw so many going through. And I didn't see him eating the little mahogany duns. And I thought, well, this is really getting to me. And he wasn't smashing, so it wasn't like he was taking big stuff. So after I did the Sally imitation, um, I went with an emerging mayfly. And we'll show you this in a second. But the reason I went with the emerging mayfly is sometimes they target cripples. And while the bunch of duns were going through the seam, uh, what I wasn't seeing was uh, cripples. And it, that's just where the nymph is right in the meniscus of the water and the wing case is opened up and is ready to come out of that nymphal case as that nymph and emerger drifts downstream and it's just stuck and paralyzed. And I bet you any money I wasn't seeing what the fish were taking because he was targeting uh, emergers stuck in the meniscus and just by default because I know that trout absolutely love emergers in the upper water column uh, I thought you know what why don't we put this pattern on and pitch it in there look one size bigger because I'm seeing all sorts of dark uh, mayfly shucks in the water now and I thought let's just go a little bit bigger that way it looks like it's a half emerged mayfly sitting there for the, for the taking first cast with this pattern and that head came up and man that was a gorgeous fish. That's a case of a prime spot like that. Um, you've kind of cracked the code on the on the pattern, so you know what they're eating. And a prime spot like that, just get to catch a really big, good fish in that spot. Well, in the time that I'm fighting the previous fish, what did that take about five, six minutes to fight it and land it? Well, you know what? Why wouldn't another fish move into that prime spot? And guess what? He moved into that prime spot, and guess what he was eating? Well, we figured that one out from the last fish, so pitch it in there, pop. You know what? It's, it's, fly fishing, everybody wants to say is so difficult, but if you just pay attention to the little clues and work your way through things, you will get the answers. And if you don't run all over the place, guess what? Just allow things to evolve, and where one thing worked well, the next, the next, the next fish will probably be the same answer. <laughs>